Caitlin Buds, and this is Real Life, Real Music. Real Life, Real Music Radio. With your host, Kyle Hutton. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good. I've been in my PJs all day, and I showered about an hour ago. So I'm doing really good. Well, perfect. The day just started. Perfect. Well, we feel honored that you would get so gussied up for us I know. You should feel like that. I do. I do. (laughs) All right. So, Caitlin, the last time uh, we had the opportunity to sit down was at our home base at Mm -hmm. do do in the Woodlands. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but we had this cool poster that we put together and we called the show, uh, Cleto and Caitlin, the honeymoon is over because it was y'all's mm-hmm. first show after your honeymoon, after yeah. you got married. Yeah. We, we had fun. That was a that fun That was a night. really cool show. I, uh, had a nice fresh tan on me as much of a tan as I can get as a redhead at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, that was a really, really cool, very special show. Um, and, uh, I, am excited because this is our first time to get to sit down, uh, and it just be me and me me and you and your folks on the stage, you know, (laughs) which is really cool. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions as we go through the night, but before we go too far down that road, why don't you just pick one you want to kick us off with tonight? Um, um, this song is a song that I wrote, um, about someone in my life who was being, hurt by someone um, for way too long. And I um, was trying to think of ways that I could deal with them. Um, And I, during the day was like, maybe I could get my bass player to put some drugs in his car and maybe we could get him put away for a little while. Just get him out of our hair. Cause I just like, do not like dealing with this MF right now. And so that was like sober Caitlin thought. And, um, and I would never do anything like that, but I thought about it. And then one night when I went to sleep, I guess it was all kind of rattling around in my head, trying to fix this problem or person. And asleep me was just like, I don't know, let's just take him out to the West Texas desert and kill him. Um, and so I woke up and wrote this song called White River.
Oh. So fathers, be good to your daughters. <laughs> daughters will murder you. <laughs> now we're getting the backstory. Now we're getting the real yeah, backstory. There you go. There you go. That's great. That's and great. everyone's uncomfortable now. No, you know, the first time that, that uh, I had the opportunity to hear that song was when we we were doing video for Bruce uh, Robeson's Robeson, yeah. Next Waltz up, yeah. uh, right upstairs here. And you yeah. played that song and the whole room just stopped. And that's a, that's a great, uh, great fear. Version. Yeah, it, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Sitting over here getting uncomfortable myself. <laughs> so, uh, all right. I want to talk to you about the new project yeah. because, uh, you know, I, one of the things watching just from the sidelines um, is I, I love – and I, I, I almost don't want to call it branding, but I, I love what you're doing with the new record. And I have to ask about coming out of the spaceship at Billy Bob's <laughs> because that's got to be one of the coolest entrances I've seen in a long time. So where did the whole astronaut thing tie into the new project? And then pick a song from the new, new newly released record. And play well, first. I have a song called Marfa Lights and there's a, a line in it called I'll Be Your Cosmic Cowgirl. And uh, I, I don't know, I just love alien shit and um, I became kind of obsessed with it. And um, I, I hosted my first, so it kind of, the idea to come out of a rocket ship was like a little bit of a, a process. So I hosted a Halloween drag country show. Um, and it was like the funnest experience ever. And I had a costume contest in it. And one of the winners for the costume kegger that I had, it was called Caitlin's Cosmic Country Costume Kegger. Wow. It was so much fun. I had a dolly, a Reba, a Shania, and Cher drag queen come perform. And then we had a costume contest, and the winner was a keg, and he was a Miller Lite keg, and he was about nine feet tall, and he had an active, like, lever. And I was like, did you make this costume yourself? And he said, yes, I like to make things out of uh, cardboard and poster board and, and glue and tape. And I was like, will you make things for me? Because like, I can make this your full-time job. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, totally. And so I got his number and um, I was like, okay, I have a couple. I've got this big Billy Bob show that I want to just like go full send for. And uh, I was like, I want to have a moon and a rocket. And I was like, hang on. I don't only, not only do I want to have a rocket like hanging, what if I like came out of it? Is that too much? Is it going to be too big? And he was like, no, I want you to come out of the rocket. So he made me a full rocket to come out of. We had smoke machines coming out like it was about to lift off. And I had this cool like countdown astronaut music before the show. And it was really fun. So And, and the band had on? Astronaut suits, full aluminum suits. foil burrito and <laughs> astronaut suits. Yeah. I bet they were comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> they were a little wet after the show. I'm sure. Not I'm fun sure. Time. Okay, so uh, why don't you? Well, I want to talk more about Billy Bob's because that was a big deal. But first, why don't you uh, pick one of the songs off the new project and play it for us? So I have a couple of new ones, uh, or like new projects. That I, put okay. out. I put out several things this year, so I want to make sure that I'm doing what you're asking of me. I put uh, out. A Sad Yeehaw Sessions EP. Yep. And then I put out an album called What Else Can She Do? Yes. What Else Can She Do okay. is the one I was okay, so, hoping for. Yeah. So so this one kind of goes was on both of those projects. Um, I wrote it with my friend Angelina Presley from the Pistol Annies, who I adore. And uh, it was my second co-write of my whole life. And it was about five years ago. And it was my first trip to Nashville. And I was just like, okay, walking up to her house. Don't say anything stupid. Don't just like pretend you're a real songwriter. Just pretend and it'll be fine. In four hours, you know, we can laugh about it and be like, oh, wasn't that fun trying to be a songwriter? Um, and she made me feel right at home when we started talking about our family and just how complicated family can be at times and, um, and how we accept certain behaviors that we would not accept from our friends. And I don't think that's how it should be. And I think everyone's coming off of these holidays like just now and just feeling like the anxiety and the pressures and the subtle like backhanded comments and, um, you know, when are you going to have a baby? And, you know, that kind of stuff that yeah. that really makes you tense around your family or or actual just like abuse and verbal abuse and all the things that we kind of um, put under a rug and try to dismiss just because someone's family. And I just think that um, if someone doesn't love you for who you are, exactly who you are, if you feel like you have to be someone else when you're around them, 
or if they're just a dick and you don't want to be around them, you shouldn't have to be around those people, family or not. Um, sorry, I kind of got on a soapbox. That's but, all right. Uh, so that day we wrote this song um, called Blood. Ready? One, two, three. Like, music can be so good and, like, done so well that the message of it almost gets lost on it you totally, a yeah. little bit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. something, something, whether it's instrumentally or vocally or just how a song's written, and, and I really feel yeah. like songs that you, you have like that one are kind of all three. Um, and 
and the depth of it can almost get lost on you because it's well, I think it, done so well. Well, thanks. Yeah. I think like I think it leaves enough to the imagination too, like where people can put themselves. No matter what level of you know hatred you may have for me for your family, whether it's just like oh my god they drive me crazy sometimes, but I'm gonna go over to their house for dinner. Whether it's that level or just like the worst of the worst, where you like are you have to go no contact. And, yeah. Um, I think that people can relate to that at yeah. whatever level they're at. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that was kind of the goal was yeah. to not just narrow it down because family is, you know, I mean, we all have family that's and right. most of them are pretty cringe sometimes. So um, <laughs> everybody has that uncle. Everybody's right? got that. Yeah. Uncle. Okay. So yeah, I, I want to revisit the, the, the kind of the concept and the topic, but first let's talk about the presentation and, and what I want to know is like where, where, who and what would you say shaped the way you deliver music? Like, like who were not just your influences, but who were the people that inspired you to become the artist that you've become now? Because, I mean, it takes, whether it's guitar playing or vocals or songwriting, like all of those are different crafts, yeah. right? And so what has inspired you, that whether it's the people specific yes. songs, whatever, to kind of shape yourself into the artist that you've become? I honestly, I don't think that it's just one artist or anything. I feel like it's just the women in my life that I've, I've really like enjoyed listening to their, their complex stories and kind of what it means to be a woman. And, um, and I think that just watching just my whole life experience, just like watching it from my perspective um, has totally shaped how I view the world, and that's just kind of what comes out. But as far as um, influences and things like that, I really look up to people like Brandy Carlisle, and um, and starting out, you know, I really loved Taylor. I love Taylor Swift. I love the the chicks. I love uh, I love. Miranda Lambert, The Chicks, and Taylor Swift were like my top three reasons why I picked up the guitar and wanted to write my own songs and play my instrument and yeah. sing my own shit. So yeah. um, they were just so instrumental in that. And then like once I figured out who their influences were, I got to find out about all my favorite songwriters like John Prine and just so many, um, just so many, there's so many levels of like where... I don't know. I just I feel like I have so many influences that I, I had to like make a playlist because I get asked that question. Yeah. And it's like all over the place from like Avril Lavigne to like uh, Rob Zombie. Like there's just like too many. <laughs> and I and uh, but really mostly just the things that have shaped me as an artist are just my life experiences with, you know, for this album, the women that have raised me and been around yeah. me and their life experiences and seeing it through my perspective and then other female artists as well. Yeah. So I, I, and I think we can tell by the audience tonight, you, you definitely have a mixed audience of male, female, yeah. uh, unless all the males here got drugged by a female um, here. But it, you, you have a mixed audience. I have to imagine, though, based on your material and like what you just described. I, I would guess that you get a lot of people coming up to you at the merch table, um, females relating to the, yeah. the empowerment that you're singing about, whether mm -hmm. it's through boundaries with family or... or I think or, a lot of it is, is is the way that we deal with things silently. Women deal with things a lot more quietly than I think men do, and we and we have to because that's how kind of society has kind of boxed us in. And, and I think, you know, we've been kind of trained not to talk about things like blood and things like abuse and things like, you know, someone in our life dealing with drug abuse or substance abuse, and we've been trained to not talk about these things, but they are within all of us and everyone knows someone that's gone yeah. through that male or female but I will say for my songs like It Won't Always Be This Way and um, in White River a lot of women have come up about you know their struggles with someone an abuser and um, yeah. it's it's like heart it's a lot of trauma dumping on me sometimes and um, but it does make me feel comforted knowing that my song like at least you know whether it's like they just feel like they kind of killed them in their own way. Um, yeah, yeah. Or you just you, you just helped them feel less alone because they yeah. heard something that they connected with. Yeah. So I was going to use that to ask you if you would you would tell us about it. It won't always be this way. Yeah. Play that song for us. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are these first three songs. I mean, they're just uh, all all about the same person. <laughs> and um, my mom was getting a divorce and from my dad, and it was um, the hardest thing that I've ever 
experienced. And, um, God damn it. What? So it's okay. <laughs> Are y'all doing okay out there? Is this is this okay? Is this too real for anybody? Or are we we all right? Okay. Yeah. Speaking of women, there's some women problems happening right now that's causing these tears. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> for a long time, we were dealing with this divorce thing, and we got kicked out of our house. Mm. Why am I crying? This is so bad. I knew I wasn't. I told myself I wasn't going to cry. We got kicked out of our house and didn't have anywhere to go except for my grandma's literal garage. And we had my two dogs and it was, it was really, really rough. And, and having to watch my mom go through that and just be gaslit for six years, Mm. it was really, really tough. And we kept saying this phrase, you know, it won't always be this way. We won't be living in grandma's garage for forever. And man, it didn't feel like it wouldn't be always that way for a long time. And yeah, can we get to Yeah, this? we're, we're <laughs> working towel, on it. Please? We need bar napkins uh, or something up here to so, the front. So we, it really, oh my God, bless you. Of course a woman has it. <laughs> of course she does. I feel like I failed you. <laughs> of course she has one. And Thank I'm going to watch my back for the rest of the show. <laughs> so, so for a long time, it just didn't feel like it was going to get better. We did not see the light at the end of the tunnel at all. It, it was just, it was hell. Mm. And we thought he was going to like kill us, I mean, honestly. And, um... Because he made threats to, and and I hate I hate even like saying that, but he, he we really feared for our life because of money, mm-hmm. and um and and how that was, and and just me speaking about it publicly, I mean, and I it really do for a long time like feared my life, but I was like, you know what, he would love it if I shut up about it, he would absolutely love it, but screw that, I'm gonna keep talking about it because he he hurt my mama. Yeah. <laughs> And so mm. this song was something that I wrote. Um, I started writing in a hotel parking lot and I was circling the parking lot after like a awful, just like a, a show that like didn't feel very fulfilling one night and um, just didn't go very well. And I'm just like, God, am I, is this going to like ever turn around for me? And so I kept, I started humming the phrase of my mom and I said, it won't always be this way. It won't always be this way. I might find a parking lot someday or a par- parking spot. And and then I just kind of like sat in the stillness of my car and just started writing just, just everything and just word vomiting. And this is what came out. Um, it's called, it won't always be this way. Thank you for the clean eggs. <laughs> Sorry, I should go to therapy. Okay. <laughs> Speak of the devil and he walks It's like his ears burn when I talk in my gut Just trying to do whatever To somehow make myself feel better But I guess I got you to think Broken like the bottle that you drank
cry, my little one. And don't talk about what your daddy done. Like a bird will fly away someday, and I promise I'll plan our getaway. Make me need one of these. Wow. Yeah, I'm the best. <laughs> God. All right, I'm going to change the subject no, please, completely. Please. We're going to change the subject, and I'm going to tell a little funny story. Yeah, I've got please. two little girls, one's nine yeah. and one's seven, and I don't know, in your vehicle, I've, I've got a truck, and on the radio, when I'm listening to the radio and the title to a song comes on, um, and then you know the artist's name gets displayed, Here's here's what happens in in my truck. Uh, the song you know titled Jackson will come on, and and the girls love that song nine and seven. But they think the funniest part of it is when the radio for some reason says Jackson butts, <laughs> and they think it is the funniest thing because it separates your name, Caitlin, and then butts, and they just think it's the funniest thing. So let's change the subject oh, for a please. minute and let's talk about. The song Jackson's great. It's a Thank great, you. you know, you yeah. right. You got to be careful if you're going to do a throwback to something like that. And you did yeah. that song is great. Thank you. I um I I was driving uh, spring break and I decided to take my whole family in my big old nine foot tall silver bullet van, and uh, I had the cousins, grandma, grandpa, mom, and just all the cousins, and it was a shit show. Um, I'm sorry if I'm cursing on your thing. I, I think we can get away with that. Okay, we can bleep it out. Um, it, it was madness, and I'm just like white knuckling, like through on the highway, just hoping to not wreck, and then, you know, just the chaos of family back there. And uh, my grandma was real worried about my grandpa's legs. He's got big, long legs, and he was just worried about him in, on that drive. She kept sticking her head up and saying, Caitlin, I don't, I don't know if we're going to make it to Jackson. It was the halfway point to, <laughs> to where we were going. And I said, Grandma, we're going to make it to Jackson. We've got the hotel booked, and we've got to make it there. So just I'm going to be driving as fast as I can and as safe as I can, but damn it, we're going to make it to Jackson. <laughs> and, I, and I wrote it down on my phone for whatever reason. And then it came to be Johnny Cash's birthday, and I was thinking about what it been, what it must have been like to be June Carter Cash and be in love with someone who I'm sure acted up a time or two, and uh, just being in love with Johnny Cash. I mean, he was probably a wreck sometimes, and probably the greatest thing in the world sometimes, yeah. too, and I think that, that is uh, no um, stranger to us women, being in love with difficult men. And uh, I started writing this song, and every time I'd get mad at Cleto, I would just write a line down, and <laughs> we're not going to make it to Jackson. Uh, but yeah, I had to watch, walk the line about 18 times to try and get that second verse, and... Um, 
And then I brought it to my mom, and I was like, I just feel like something's missing in this, and I need, like, a bridge, certain, so can you help me? And she's a, she, my mom's a teacher, and she's a great, she's a great writer, and she's got a really great imagination, and she came up with this uh, pre-course bridge thing, and in, like, 15 minutes, and I was like, okay, like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> the songwriting is my full-time job, and it should be yours, too, so <laughs> she gave me my pre-course. This song was called Jackson. He said it won't be much, but I'll get you one soon. I thought we'd be married in a fever. I thought we'd ride off like Johnny in June. But I don't think we'll make it to Jackson. No, I don't think. They're too good at telling lies. Well, it takes a lot of pain and time to change a woman's mind. But I've reached the point of no return, and you cross that line. So I don't think we'll make it to Jackson. No, I don't. Think forget to ask you to do it i need you to do a liner to kick off the radio show oh, yeah. so this is caitlin butts and this is real life real music and then i need you guys to go nuts which obviously we don't have a problem with tonight okay <laughs> so that's great and uh i'll need you to just keep it going for about four minutes and then i'm gonna cut it no i'm just kidding uh when i go like this we, we've got plenty <laughs> okay howdy folks i'm caitlin butts and this is real life real music <laughs> Yeah. 
Man, y'all are great. Damn. We love it. Okay, so we talked about uh, the fact that you've got two projects that have come out recently. One is the, the sad, remix, the sad yeehaw sessions. Yeah. Tell us about that project and uh, pick pick one off of that one and play it for us. Um, okay, so I um, I have a friend, his name is Kurt Ozon, and he plays pedal steel for Luke Combs. And uh, he lives right down the street from us, and he is our good buddy, um, who's just like the sweetest guy to be around. And um, he likes to invite us over for beers and hang out, and my good friend Fernando, who's um, my husband's photographer and media person, who's my best friend. Uh, we just decided to go over to Kurt's house and record some songs, and um, and Kurt wanted to play uh, Dobro on it, and we hit the record button, and even, you know, at the end of the night, we were like, you know, if that was good, like, let's put it on YouTube or something, Yeah. but uh, if not, like, we had a good time drinking White Claws together, so... <laughs> um, Anyway, so we put out two uh, acoustic videos, Angels Like You and Blood, um, and then I was like, let's do that again last fall. Oh, wait, hang on. Yeah, it's 2023 now. Okay, last fall, <laughs> we decided to do, uh, do it again, and I was thinking about doing um, a duet with Cleto, so we did Whiskey Lullaby, and... Um, and I don't remember the other songs. Um, what I can were they? tell you. Please tell Angels me. Like You, Hold You Down, Hold One you More down. Girl, and Blood. And Blood. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we did those, and um, I I had been doing kind of this. Someone, one of my friends had said uh, that the whole album was sad yeehaw vibes, and so I just loved I loved that so much, and I thought it was pretty <laughs> encapsulating of, of me. And... Uh, and so that's why I decided to call the little acoustic project. That was just kind of something fun that I wanted to do, the Sad Yeehaw session. So um, I'm going to do a song called Hold You Down from that. Um, so one of my, two of my friends wrote this song. It's Lindsey Buchanan and Emily Jane. And uh, they're, one of them is a cop and one of them is a nurse. And they just wrote this like beautiful song that I've always loved but didn't have a place for it on this last record. And... Um, and so I wanted to put it here because I'm obsessed with this song. If my guitar will be in tune. <laughs> Are y'all doing okay out there? All right. Well, it's a shame. And it's bittersweet. It's a rose parade on a small town dead end street. I'm just coming down from a memory I'm trying not to think about you Flying high without me I woke up hungover And I woke up blue I woke up alone In a bed I shared with you I'm trying
great for a fiddle player, is it, Nellie? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when when did you write your first song? How old were you when you wrote your first song? My first good one, or my first like no, just when one when did you like, no when did you my diary? yeah when did you decide <laughs> that that writing whether it was put to music or not yet when did you realize that that was a way that you were going to express yourself or process stuff that you were going through? Um, it was after um, my first kiss denied me uh, the next Monday at lunch that, that I had a lot of feelings about. Uh, <laughs> not great ones. And they weren't very poetic, <laughs> but they were lots of feelings. Um, but that was probably like the first like I don't know, remnants of a song that I made. Um, but my first, like, real songs, probably 17 or 18 years old, like Wild Rose and things like everything yeah. that Basically, everything that was on my first album, those were the first, like, complete songs that were, you know, releasable. And, and yeah. they're, everything I wrote, I put on that album. Yes, and Same Hell, Different Devil came out in 2015. So that would have been, what, eight, eight years ago? Is my math right? Yeah. Something like that? In February. Yeah. So you want to pick one? Pick one of those early ones. And Well, okay. So I was thinking there there is actually one song that I didn't put on that record. Okay. And, and I played it the first time I ever came to Steamboat at the open mics. And I found a video of it the other day and I was like, oh my God, I forgot about this song. And I wrote the lyrics to it down the other day. Um, or today, as, you, as I was sitting on the stage, actually. Um, <laughs> and uh, and this is one of the first songs that, um, before I recorded Same Hell, Different Devil. Is it okay if I play that? Heck yeah. Uh, yes, we want to hear early Caitlin. But yeah, if you're also, if you're here as like a, um, just like a songwriter, but you're not on the lineup, will you like scream your name out? Like just scream right now? Anyone? Any? Yeah, one girl? Okay, cool. <laughs> Go check out the open mics because you will. I think probably um, at least several of us have started out on that open mic stage and then graduated to playing in front of more people. Um, so please go uh, check out the open mics and support those beginner songwriters, whether they're beginners or not. Um, at least beginners at Steamboat. Um, because you never know where they'll be someday. <laughs> I remember doing it with Zach Wilkerson that year too. Yeah. And he's just like the best. And I had to go after him and I was like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do those runs. <laughs> this song is called Like I Should and, and I really think that it does have a place for this on my next album that I want to record. So. Bound where no one knows my name. Well, I tell my stories in song and sound. Turn me up, I wanna sing it loud. I'll show you where I lay my blame. Well, now I'm taking my makeup off in somewhere southwest Arkansas. Sometimes it just all seems the same. But to appreciate the way the fate gets cluttered like a dirty slate, sometimes it just has to be that way. I believe that there is a devil, and I know that he is no good. But if I
So that's kind of like a, a new old one. A new old one, yeah. Yeah, all right. So you mentioned like future music. Like, a, a, are you are you have you been writing or have you been working this record so hard that you you I, are not writing right now? Well, I'm I'm glad you say that because I mean I really do go in phases of like I think there are some people that can write all the time and I'm just not one of those people. So I do go in phases of like I'm pushing an album. Or I'm, I'm, I put my whole ass into it. You know, I put my whole ass into touring. I put my whole ass into writing and then doing the whole cycle all over again. And so um, right now I'm, I'm in the phase of touring. Yeah. Um, but I'm also like got my whole brain on what I want to do next. And I think it's going to be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Is that all we're going to get? Um, yeah. It, 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 I'm we, trying. We people. need a whole another hour to, to for me to talk about what I want to do next. Cause, okay. Uh, there's a lot, but um, I do. I can play something from it. From y'all want to hear something brand new? Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. So. Yeah. Let's do that one. Um. Let's do that Roadrunner song. So I wrote. I did. Um. I wrote a lot in 2020. Um, I, me and Cloto moved into my mom's house, um, which, you know, being fiancés was just like not super ideal. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but we did it, and it was fun, and um, at times, and um, I got a lot of people, you know, as a songwriter in the pandemic. Um, we became very unessential really quick and we just like didn't know what to do with ourselves and Cleto built a garden outside and I watched uh, Tiger King inside uh, <laughs> and that was kind of like our dynamic um, and, um, but then some days I'd go over to my aunt's pool and I'd, and I'd try to soak up the sun and uh, a couple times I went over there and wrote songs Missing the Road um, but one day it was my job to uh, wait for the plumber to come over to our house. So I had to sit my happy ass on the couch all day and just wait for him. It was a very important business. <laughs> and uh, I just miss, I miss being on the road. I missed, you know, all the weird people that I get to meet at the merch table and loves <laughs> gas stations and my fiddle player and, and all of you guys. And, uh, and I just kind of wanted to write a fun song um, that kind of encapsulated what it, it feels like to be on the road for myself. And I was listening to a lot of Eddie Rabbit too, so. I wrote the song called Road Runner.
Wow. <laughs> You need to listen to more Eddie Rabbit. Right? <laughs> Come on. I love it. Okay, so let's go uh let, let's let's go back to uh the Twilight Zone again and let's talk about <laughs> your first your first headline on the main stage at Billy Bob's. Yeah. And of course, in Caitlin style, you walk out of a spaceship because you met a guy that's good at paper mache and he's going to build all your stuff from now on. So uh, I just want to know, when, when you walked out and saw how many people had bought a ticket yeah. to come see you that night, what was going through your brain? It, I will say, the second time we came out of the spaceship, or the second show that I had there, there was a lot more smoke, and I didn't, I really couldn't see the crowd for a little while. Mm -hmm. But the first show that like I really... Um, I played the Honky Tonk stage earlier in the year. I think in okay. July, wasn't it? Um, he doesn't know. Um, I played in July, and uh, we're going to go with that. Um, and it was my first time ever playing Billy Bob's, and I was terrified. I was so scared. That's such a big room, and just like legendary stage. And I almost like was too scared to promote it because I'm like, okay, if I put... If I put my whole ass in, into this and no, pe no one show, shows up, like, I just, like, I'm going to be really embarrassed, you know. I hope that, because I played in Fort Worth and probably had, like, maybe 300 people come out to a show at the at Magnolia Motor Lounge, because that's kind of like the cap there. And so I'm like, okay, 300 in that 5,000 cap room um, is going to feel really small. So I'm like, okay, just really anxious. And um, Robert Gallagher, who... Um, who is like the the manager over there at Billy Bob's the day of the show was just super hyped up and I was just like you know not letting myself get too excited because I don't <laughs> like to be let down and uh, he was like tonight's gonna be awesome there's gonna be like way more people than you think and I was like okay <laughs> thank you for lying to me to make me feel better but whatever it's fine um and I'm just getting excited with my band and and I every show I, I kind of asked like my mom before because I have anxiety, I'm like, hey, mom, are there people here? I don't want to know how many, but I'm like, are there people here? And she's like, yeah, there are some people here. And uh, it's going to be a lot, but I don't even want to tell you how many people are here, but it's a lot. And it ended up being 2,000 people. Girl. It, Come on. It blew me away. And I and I was so glad that we, you know, kind of, no one told us before um, what, what the, who had walked in and how many people, but they just kind of looked at me and we were like, you are going to lose your mind. And so we stayed back behind the stage, didn't look at who, how many people were out there until we were up on it. And Lane, how do you, how did you feel about it? Uh, I was blown away. I went up and I, There's a microphone right there. I was pretty blown away. I went up the stairs. I think I, I, I took a peek yeah. before you guys did. And I like looked over at you guys and my eyes were <laughs> really big. I mean, it was the biggest show we've ever played for or played in for our crowd like I, yeah. that people have never that many people have never showed up for me i've played i've opened up for people with that many people but it's like all those people were there to see me and i had and i keep had it been i kept having to remind myself that like oh my god they're there for me and maybe yeah. a little bit like the alcohol but like they're there for me <laughs> <laughs> and it was like such an incredible feeling and then just having the same you know awesome experience that yeah. being, to be asked to play the main stage which is a huge deal um that was great so i just really wanted i kind of wanted to thank Fort Worth in a way by just like making it super special and unique and come out of a rocket ship for my next for my debut. So that's kind of what I want to do. I love it. Okay, well well first on behalf of me and everybody here, congratulations Thank you. for that. Thanks. That's amazing. Okay. And second thing, now tell us about Marfa Lights and play that one for okay, us. Okay, yeah. Um so uh whenever I first started dating my husband, um, Cleta Cordero of Flatland Cavalry. Um he, he's from way out in West Texas in Midland, and he, growing up, would go to Marfa, Texas, because he had family in Alpine. And so he had told me about this mystical, mystical you know, space cowboy place, and he was going to take me out to see the Marfa lights, and I was like, okay, it's like, uh, he's kind of a conspiracy theorist in some ways, and so I was like, okay, we're going to go see the Marfa lights. We're going to go see Bigfoot, too. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then we went out there, and I may have been the weed, but I definitely saw Marfa lights out there. It was so cool, and uh, I definitely believe in aliens now. I'm totally, like, into it, um, as you can tell with all the uh, alien stuff that I do now. 
Um, but whenever I got home, we were, um, we were, it was Halloween time, so we were Jesse and, and Woody for Halloween. All right. And I, this is going somewhere, I promise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we were Jesse and Woody for Halloween, and someone on the internet was like, you know, it wasn't Jesse and Woody that were together, it was Jesse and Buzz. And I was like, why are you here? Um, <laughs> Okay, but he looks like Woody. Anyways, um, but then I was thinking about Marfa, and then I was thinking about how Jesse and Buzz, like if they went to Marfa, that'd be like they're the best date ever. It's got all the space cowboy things, and and my brain's weird. So I, <laughs> that's what I was thinking about, and I sat on my bed, and I started writing a song called Marfa Lights. Here we go. One. So I've kind of been leading you all over the place all night. So I want you to just pick one you want to play. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So um, let's do this. Okay. Can I brag? Can I brag? I'm going to brag. Uh, so 
Uh, Rolling Stone told uh, put out their top songs of the year this yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And, and they put one of my songs on their list on Come number forty four. <laughs> really really proud of it because like there's no one um like in the america like no one in like our realm that's in that it's mostly like pop singers and like mm -hmm. like zach bryan's on it yeah. um but i looked and like that's like the only one like in our like you know realm that's in it and i was just really shocked and surprised too i thought it was a joke honestly like i thought someone was like yeah my list for the top songs of that rolling stone missed was this song um but then i was like no they like really did that and i found that out in a jiffy loop and that was really cool um, <laughs> uh i wrote this song during 2020 as well and i was thinking about all the women stuck at home all the people stuck at home and how i was very um unessential and um and I thought about all the people that had to keep working and, and who always work and work the toughest jobs and don't get paid nearly enough for it. And uh, I wrote this song called What Else Can She Do? Um, and I also plan to put out a music video for this song and for Blood this year. Um, so, and we just finished it and I'm really excited and that's me announcing it to the world. Okay. <laughs> and Grace York is also in that music video too. <laughs> for all the ladies. <laughs> she left the country with big city dreams running wild in her mind. Looking for love or adventure or anything else she could find. But her small So she wakes up and fills up her own coffee cup and wonders if God hears her. She'd like to go back 
So she wakes up and puts on her apron. What else can she do? Have y'all had a good time tonight? Man, well, Caitlin, I want to tell you, I, I know for me and on behalf of everybody else here, thanks for uh, thanks for doing this show with us tonight. No, thank you guys so much. Y'all yeah. have been like the best, honestly. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, I Sorry mean, I cried so much. No, listen, I mean, that's that's. That's what allows us to connect more with you. You know, yeah. you, you give us these pieces of your heart and mm -hmm. sometimes we just hear them through the microphone and sometimes we see them in your eyes, you know, yeah. so thank yeah. you for that. And and I want to tell you this, um, as, as a dad of, of two girls, I mean, I think there's things in life, you know, there's things we want to say and then there's things we need to say and they're both important. I hope, I hope both my little girls will be as brave as you Thanks. in what they need to say. So, yeah. Yeah. That's really sweet. So uh, now you have to pick a song that you're going to close us out with tonight. Okay. Well, speaking of being brave, um, I, I have a line that has the word brave in it, so that made me think of it. Um, so this is going to be on my next album for sure. I, those of you who have followed me have, for a while probably have heard this song before. Um, but anyways, I, I used to live in Oklahoma City for a few years. I went to college there. And... Uh, when I did, I'd go play at the nursing home once a month, and it was one of my favorite things in the entire world to go and do. Um, for a few reasons, there was uh, one was the fact that they were just like the most ornery, like, um, hilarious, and brutally honest, uh, and just kind of mean like people ever, and I loved it so much. Uh, every interaction I had was just like a trip. I loved it. Uh, one lady, her bit was that she would stand in front of me and plug her ears the whole time I played. <laughs> God love her. Um, I loved it so much, though. Uh, but another reason why I love playing songs in there, I'd go play classic country songs like Patsy Cline and Merle Haggard and Hank Williams. And um, when those folks heard a song that they used to know, their eyes would just light up. And it was like the coolest thing I think I've ever seen. And so one day I was in there and I was playing a show in the cafeteria and uh, this woman who had been in there every single time I, I came and played, she was always right here to my right, just grinning from ear to ear. And uh, she wasn't there this particular day. Her name was Elsa and she, um, her, she was from Germany and she just like always just lit up my life. And um, that day with, uh, well, hang on before I get into Elsa, um, there was a, a woman being pushed around in a wheelchair by her husband, and she had this big old water burger and Coke in her lap. And I was thinking, oh shit, who's gonna bring me water burger and Coke when I'm too old to drive there myself at 2 a.m.? Damn it! I was single at the time, and uh, and then Elsa wasn't wasn't at my show, and I was like, where is Elsa? She's always right here. And they said she's not with us anymore. And so I ran to my car as quick as I could so to get some tears out. I am, I'm never short of tears, by the way. Um, I can always cry. Um, <clears throat> but so I, I wrote some lines down, had a quick little car cry, as you do. And I went back and, and played my set. And then my friend, Courtney Patton, um, was visiting uh, Oklahoma City. And we were playing the Wormy Dog one night. But before the, the show, I wanted to, I needed her help to finish this song that I had scribbled a whole bunch of feelings that I felt about life after losing someone that I kind of barely knew. And then it just all kind of, I had all these verses. And I was just like blubbering to her for like four hours. Like, I want to say this here. I have all these like stanzas and stuff and she helped me like kind of structure it in a way that sounded like a real song <laughs> and um, uh, I wrote it for all the people that I met at the nursing home and what they taught me and how I want to be treated when I get to be their age and uh, mostly how I want to act before I get there the song is called Elsa thank you guys so much again for being like the best and uh, let me cry on stage <laughs> Surrounded by women watching the TV. I asked him how'd he get to be so lucky. He said, Some men have it and some men don't. Now, hush, cause I'm watching. 
watching my favorite show. True story. Elsa was from Germany. She loved my song. She was always smiling. She said she had seen all kinds of war. And she used to play guitar, but she don't Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Caitlin Butts. Cheers, everybody. Happy Steve 